be with you. Welcome to worship. Uh, this is the day of the baptism of our Lord. And so we hear that beautiful story and discover what it might mean for us. So let's begin uh, with our confession and forgiveness. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us. For his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized into Christ faithful in their calling to be your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through your son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight, and honored, I love you. I give people in return for you, Nations, in exchange for your life, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ascribe to the Lord your gods. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. 
The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord splits the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees rhyme and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. A reading from Acts. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. Glory to you. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, to clear his threshing floor, and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the Beloved, with you, I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel writer, St. Luke, keeps his story of Jesus' baptism very brief. Jesus, like all the other people who had come to see John, was baptized, and after Jesus was baptized, he started praying. And notice what happens next. Luke writes, and as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. So, we celebrate the baptism of our Lord every year, and if you've been a Christian for some time or uh, spent your life in, in church, uh, you have probably heard that story a lot of times, right? A very familiar scene. But uh, I love those words about uh, Jesus' baptism immediately after his, his baptism. What's he doing? I just really recently noticed this. It says, and as he was praying. So what's Jesus do after his baptism? He prays. Uh, and when you think about it, isn't that Jesus? Um, 
right after his baptism, he prays because he prays all the time in his ministry. When you open the Gospels and you look, he's always praying at important events in his ministry. As a matter of fact, even on ordinary days, he's up before the dawn and he's finding a quiet place to go and pray. Uh, here's, so here's Jesus. He's the He's God incarnate in the flesh, the very manifestation of God himself. And he felt the need to be in continuous communication with the Father. That's their relationship, a relationship of love. And they communicate with one another. Now, Jesus gives a marvelous example here, of course. But then we think about maybe our own prayer lives. Uh, We don't know the Father as well as the Son. As a matter of fact, no one knows the Father, Jesus says, except uh, those to whom he has revealed the Father. And yet, we spend often a limited time in prayer in our lives. There's a great story uh, written by Herb Miller. He's an uh, old theologian and preacher. And he talks about a, a, a tour that he was getting at a large uh, university. He was about to be a guest speaker there. And he takes a a tour of the campus ministry, right? Goes to the campus ministry area. And as they walk down a hallway in that campus ministry building, uh, he sees a sign um, marked prayer room over a doorway. And so uh, as they move past the door to that prayer room, it became obvious that the director of of the, the campus ministry didn't intend to show him that particular room. So curious, what's he do as he walks by? He turns the doorknob and looks in, right? And uh, when he opens the door, he gets this really musty, awful odor that comes out. And he says the room was stuffed with uh, boxes, books, clothes hangers, and junk. Um, on, on, the, on the little altar that was in there, there, there was a pair of worn-out cowboy boots, an old Gilby's gin box, and a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> so... Um, This was supposed to be the prayer room for the university campus ministry, right? So the director, very embarrassed, explained, uh, uh, well, we use this for a a storage room during the summer, and we just haven't gotten around to cleaning it out yet. So, uh, you know, Herb Miller, he says, at first, this thing seemed like a sacrilegious thing, stacking a prayer room full of junk. But then he says he realized that the room was a parable of his own life sometimes, so busy traveling around the country and speaking and doing good things, he'd, he'd lost the habit of praying. The time he had formerly spent talking with God each day was now crowded full of other things. I think that happens to all of us, right? We can lose our prayer life. We're so busy that we've crowded out one of the most necessary practices for living a life with God. But Jesus... He's our example, and he never lets that happen. So immediately after he's baptized, what's Jesus doing? He's praying, right? And then what happens? Well, Luke says the heavens were opened. Think about that. When when Jesus prays, the heavens are opened, and we might even say that uh, then when we pray, that opens the heaven of God to us as well. I've, uh, I've spoken to many people in my years of ministry um, who are, are going into surgery or, or after their surgery. They talk about how uh, they, they had a Christian who was their surgeon and how that, that surgeon actually prayed for them just before their surgery. Have you ever heard somebody tell that story? Um, and, and people are, are always so pleased with that. You know, here they are going into one of the most... Um, nerve-wracking experiences in life, heading into surgery. And what's, what's, their, what's their surgeon do? S- takes the time to pray. And they're knowing when they pray, it's surgeons do, that uh, they're going to be helping God with the healing, but it's really God that ultimately brings the healing. But I've talked to so many people who've been so amazed and so very pleased at a surgeon who prayed for them. And perhaps uh, with everything we do to care for another person, we should go into that, uh, that practice praying. There's a really old story about a woman uh, by the name of Sister Elizabeth Kenny. And 
Uh, she was a, a nurse in Australia in the first half of the 20th century. And she actually developed a, a very new and successful approach for treating victims of, of polio, especially children. And it was, a, it was a method that the medical community took some time to embrace, but after a while, uh, they realized that she was onto something. So the story goes that back in those days when somebody got polio, they would splint their, their limbs because their limbs would often uh, curl up or um, uh, they, would, they would have spasms and things like that and it became very uncomfortable um, for them and so uh, they would splint those limbs. And as a matter of fact, they would even put limbs in plaster casts just to keep them immobile in hopes that they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't atrophy. So, um, instead of putting casts on polio victims' limbs, Sister Kenny put hot compresses um, on the body, uh, and she thought that that would, that, that would help, help them. Um, she thought that it would, would stop the spasms in their limbs. Well, uh, one day, Sister Kenny was called to the bedside of a seven-year-old girl who lived in the bush country in Australia, and she had a lot of pain, a very high fever. The muscles of her leg and her foot were contracted, and um, Sister Kenny didn't really recognize the symptoms at first, so she uh, asked a rider on horseback to go to the nearest telegraph station and get some advice over the telegraph wires. And finally, the reply came back. Uh, the symptoms you describe indicate infantile paralysis. No known cure. Do the best that you can. So um, she used this, this treatment that she had, had done in the past where she, she put the, um, the warm compresses on, on this child, and, and it worked. Um, and later when she received recognition for this discovery of hers that finally got picked up as a regular practice at that point in time. This is all before vaccines for polio, by the way. Um, she was asked, uh, did you, what did you do first to invent this procedure? Did you tear up a blanket for the hot packs? And this was her reply, and this is the point of the story. Actually, she said, the very first thing I did was kneel down and pray. So she knew that she could not give a treatment without praying, and somehow uh, she was given a way that became adopted in treating polio. So what happens when we pray? The heavens open, right? And when, when people pray, good things do happen. Now when Jesus prayed on the day that he was baptized, the heaven opened, and it says the Holy Spirit descended on him bodily uh, like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. So, uh, there's a little story about coal miners in England. Uh, and they would go sometimes from the central shaft where they first descended into the coal mine, uh, many miles through horizontal shafts. So there was always a danger of the men getting lost in those coal mines in England. Well, one particular day, two miners did lose their way out of the mine, and their lights finally went out, and they were in danger of losing their lives. So after wandering around in the darkness for a long time, they finally sat down, and one of them said, let's sit perfectly still and see if we can feel the way in which the air is moving, because it always moves towards the shaft. And they sat there for a very long time when suddenly one of them felt a slight touch of air on his cheek. And he jumped up and said, I felt it. And they went in the direction of the, in which the air was moving and they finally reached that central shaft and freedom from their dark captivity. Now, what's interesting about that story is that they felt that, uh, that wind, that little bit of, that little breath of air. Well, the Hebrew word, for spirit, right, Holy Spirit, is ruach, which means uh, wind or breath. Uh, the Greek word is pneuma, again, it means wind or breath. 
It's the same word for spirit. And in a very real way, we also need to feel the movement of the air, right? We need to experience the movement of, the, of, of God's spirit in our life to direct us. And that's what happened to those miners. And so we want the Holy Spirit to come to us as much as the spirit came to Jesus in his baptism. So what happens when we pray? The heaven opens, the wind of God's spirit blows, and um, we actually become new people. Uh, you know, we should not ignore the blowing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, there are times when I get a, a very uh, uh, compelling feeling that I need to see somebody or give them a call, and it always turns out uh, that that was a well-directed urge that I had or a feeling and I think the spirit does that for us don't ignore it when the spirit is urging you on to do something so the heaven opens the wind of God's spirit blows we become new people because of the spirit and that's the wonderful promise of Christian baptism we have a new life in Jesus Christ uh, there's a great story about a machinist with the Ford Motor Company in Detroit uh, this happened many years ago when Henry Ford was still alive. And over the years, this machinist uh, took home with him a lot of parts and tools from the company, which he never bothered to return. Uh, they didn't condone this practice, but they understood basically at, at, at Ford that this sort of thing happened, right? People took stuff home from work and nothing was done about it. Well, the machinist... Uh, started uh, a life as a Christian. He was baptized and he felt that he had to change his life, live a new life. And he took his baptism very seriously. And so he finally, after walking through his workshop at home, decided that he needed to return everything. So he filled up his truck and he drove to work and he was loaded down with tools and parts that he had taken from the company from over the years. And he, he explained the situation to his foreman and said he'd never really meant to steal them, just to borrow them, and he hoped he was forgiven. Well, the foreman was absolutely amazed that something like that would happen, so uh, he got in contact with Mr. Ford, Henry Ford, and he explained the entire event. And uh, he actually had to, had to cable him by telegraph. And it came back from Henry Ford, uh, dam up the Detroit River, he said, and baptize the entire city. In other words, if only <laughs> more people would be baptized, uh, maybe uh, a contagion of honesty would overtake uh, this company and the whole city. Uh, so our hope is that every Christian takes their baptism that seriously, that, that we act like the new people that God has made us. So, when Jesus prayed on the day that he was baptized, the heaven opened, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form uh, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Something like that um, happens in our own baptism. Baptism results in our becoming a new person, and it also gives us an identity uh, as a part of the family of God. We are children of God. When that voice comes from heaven, it's actually a quote uh, from two parts of scripture. When the father speaks to the son, he's quoting Psalm 2. When he says, you are my son, the beloved, Psalm 2 is a, is a coronation psalm. When they would make somebody a king in the land of Israel, they would bring them into the temple and they would sing this, this beautiful psalm. And in the midst of the psalm, the Lord speaks to the king and says, you are my son, the beloved, and that shows that Jesus is a king, right? And then the father, the voice from heaven, also says, with you I am well pleased. That comes from Isaiah 42, which is one of the suffering serpent songs in Isaiah. Isaiah has four songs in his, his prophecy that, that tell the story of, of one who comes from God, an anointed one, um, anointed means Messiah or or Christ, or king, an anointed one who will, who will save the people by suffering for them, by taking their pains upon himself. 
So when the Father says from heaven, with you I am well pleased, that's from Isaiah 42, and he's saying to Jesus, you're a servant as well. So you are my son, the beloved, he's a king, with you I am well pleased, he's a servant. And you know what, that's our identity also. In his first letter, St. Peter writes that we are a royal priesthood. We're royalty. When we're baptized, we become part of God's family. Jesus, our brother, God, our father. And so uh, if Jesus is our brother and he's the king, that must make us a prince or princess, right? In the, kingdom, in, the, in the family of the Lord. But we're also a servant. Peter says we're a royal priesthood. And the word priest actually means servant. And so that's who we are in our baptism as well. Just like Jesus, we are, a, we are uh, part of a royal family and we're made to be servants, priests of God. So let's, let's take up the practice of prayer just as often as Jesus so that the heaven might be opened upon us and that the Holy Spirit would come upon us and we would follow that leading of the Spirit, the breath of the Spirit, Let's always remember our identity in baptism, a royal priesthood, just like, our, uh, just like our brother, Jesus, who's a king and a servant. And most of all, remember that, that God says to us, you are my child whom I love. With you I am very well pleased. Amen. time we install our uh, congregational church council we do this over the course of three different services uh, so folks have a choice as to when they come and we have one of our members of council here today so I invite Janet Rump to come forward and I will read off uh, all the folks that are serving on our church council you can face the folks here Good man. Uh, I'll read off those folks who are uh, a part of the church council this year Terry Raybert serves as president, Drew Potts as vice president, Mark Reeser as secretary, Nick Craig as treasurer, and then we have Courtney Hamm, Deb Webb, Eric Watson, Janet Rump, Lori Dyer, Marvin Crawford, Rob Shetler, and Ursula Leinbaugh. And so, in holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ liberated you and all of us from sin and death and made us members of his church. Through word and sacrament, you have been nurtured in faith. I ask you together with all who are here gathered to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we are baptized. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit 
and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. St. Paul writes, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives to everyone ability for particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. So you have been elected to uh, leadership and trust in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith Reflect him in whose name we gather. You are to work together with other members to see that the worship and work of Christ are done in this congregation, and that God's will is done in this community and the whole world. You are to be diligent in your specific area of serving, that the one Lord who empowers you is glorified. You are to be an example of faith active in love to help maintain the life and harmony of this congregation. And so on behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask you, are you ready to accept and faithfully to carry out the duties of the office to which you've been elected? Yes, I God. And people of God, I ask you, will you support your elected church council leaders? Will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? Yes, I God. So I now declare you installed as a council member of this congregation. God bless you with this Holy Spirit that you may prove a faithful servant of Christ. Amen. And Janet, I thank you very much. You, have, you served on church council many years ago, right, when you were also a Sunday school superintendent and a lot of other things at the same time. And, and I'm just really glad that you're returning to service on the council. I really appreciate it. All right. So let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people, according to their needs. God, our creator and redeemer, we praise and thank you that you have called us by your name, knowing and loving us more than we know or love ourselves. Holy one of Israel and savior of the human race, no matter how far we may feel from you through suffering or sin, you promise to be with us. We gather all of your scattered peoples together from every corner of the world. We rejoice and celebrate your presence and your promise among us. Lord, in your mercy, God, you are the breath of life, and you sent the apostles, Peter and John, to lay their hands on the people of Samaria and pray that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So to help us to be ambassadors of your Holy Spirit's gifts and fruit, praying for and bringing your healing touch to all who are suffering and in need of healing. On this day especially, we lift before you those whom we love who need that Holy Spirit's touch. Pete Reisner, Ruth and Leroy Kotner, Irene Watson, Shirley Mengus, Ron Seckler, John Fligger, Jeanette Calhoun, uh, Leroy Kotner, uh, Bev Heverly, Bob Shetler, Joyce Osman, Jim Yost, Carl Fossnott, Charlie Wright, Barbara Hartline, Lily Brooks, Andrew Bieber, Janice Knauer, Marian Ott, Susan Grube, Lori Yost, Sally and Dal Kaufman, Sean, Kathy Hillard, Pastor Bill Jones, Susan Gallion, Marilyn, Ronnie Johnston, Diane Brooks, Tammy Wands, uh, Donna Bridgers, Cindy Ravert, Helen Nyhard, Deb Bryson, Jeff Grube, Donna Fisher, Haley and Remy Miller, Eileen Montgomery, Margaret Birdsell, George Edwards, Bob Temple, Catherine Mingle, Candace Lumley, Velvet Bartlow, Dorothy Anderson, Jason Gamion, Todd Bieber, Barbara Mitternock, Russ Wynn, Harvey Demi, Stan Schaefer, Don Hall, Stephanie Smith, Carol Shiflett, Cindy Buck, Michael Kenny, Carol Crawford, and all whom we name out loud before you.
Grant them a great measure of your healing power. Bless those who watch over them. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty Father, in this world, we realize how much there is for us to learn from John's example of humility. Assist all leaders of the world to be humble servants of their people, that they may govern with justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed one, through the baptism and prayer of Jesus, you revealed yourself to him and delighted in him as your beloved son. We thank you for revealing yourself to us and claiming us as your children through our baptism. We pray for all who are grieving, especially the family of Ken Crawford and many others. And we ask that you would help them to, to know the promise of their baptism, the baptism of their loved one, that there is forgiveness and there is life eternal. Comfort them with those promises. Lord, in your mercy. To your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. Sharing our life, he lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to his own brilliant light. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, have men earth the roll of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Having come into the world, he fulfilled for us your holy will and accomplished our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and his promise to come again, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. And we implore you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, in these your own gifts of bread and wine, that we and all who share in the body and blood of your Son may be filled with heavenly peace and joy, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be sanctified in soul and body, and have our portion with all your saints. All honor and glory are yours, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called in his name. And thank you, Jesus Christ.
invite you to come forward for Holy Communion. There are individual glasses available on the table, so you can receive from there. And we'll just gather around the front half of the altar. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life, and we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.